Hey everybody, thanks for joining us on On the Clock with Caroline Clark. Today we have Keith Basket, who is an experienced, a seasoned commercial airline pilot and entrepreneur. Obviously he hasn't flown in a while, but he's here to talk with us today. Normally he wouldn't be. So Keith, thanks for joining us. Um, first of all, can you just tell us how did you even get into this profession? There are only 3% of commercial airline pilots are black in 2020. So how did you end up being in that very rare number? Well, Caroline, thanks for having me uh, with you. I came to, uh, to aviation just from an early age. I wanted to fly airplanes. Just being a passenger, looking out the window, thinking, this is so cool. When I grow up, this is what I want to do. So I was a pretty singularly focused uh, kid, and I made a lot of, of my decisions so that I could fly airplanes when I grew up. So for me, I ended up doing it the civilian route. I went to Embry-Riddle, I, I graduated from there, and I was a flight instructor for a couple of years before I, I got my first airline job. So that was a typical career progression uh, at that time, but um, a lot of other people were coming through the military, and that was actually the route that I thought I was, I was going to get to. Uh, I got accepted to the Naval Academy, and and one of the big barriers to uh, to being a pilot or flying is is the cost. So I thought, well, rather than have my my parents pay, I could probably go to the military and and uh, use that as the best way to to uh, finance my education. Uh, it didn't. Uh, I ended up changing plans, and that's fine. It worked out for me uh, actually. Uh, probably a little bit faster to get to uh, the commercial airline uh, side of things as that was my goal initially. Um, so for me, I, I came to it through uh, just going to right after high school, learning to fly and going to college simultaneously and then taking uh, some, some other odd jobs or smaller jobs in the industry to uh, that progressed to the point where I've been with uh, you know, a, a major global carrier for the last uh, decade, two decades and a half. Because of the pandemic, obviously the airline industry is going through a really tumultuous time um, of incredible uncertainty in the future, but you have like almost three decades in this industry. How has your career compared to whatever your fantasy of it was as a child? Oh, uh, well, as a child, all I knew was I want to fly airplanes and I didn't really understand or know that there was a difference between uh, flying domestically, internationally, or even, I didn't know much about airplanes. I did have a particular affinity for one type of airplane. I always said, oh man, I, the 747 is is the queen of the fleet. That's the one I always want to fly. And Why? so for me, I, Why the 747? Well, I think it it was just, it was larger than any other aircraft that was operating it had four engines and it, it just kind of looked from uh, with all the lines, it looked majestic. I was a big fan of that airplane before I knew anything about airplanes. And fortunately my career, I was able to fly that for 15 years uh, before, uh, before they di disappeared from uh, the US uh, passenger carriers. So I, I d actually thought about that and dream actualized. I, I did it uh, for a good, the better part of my career, I was able to fly that airplane. And what what is a life of a pilot like? You know, I think a lot of us, obviously as a passenger, we see the pilots, we hear the pilots, we know you're gonna get us there, we pray you're gonna get us there safely. But, you know, mm -hmm. you spend so much time on the road, particularly when you're flying outside of the country, um, you know, lots of travel, lots of seeing all the ports of the world, but you know, there's also obviously a political side. This is a job at the end of the day. So how, how has it compared to what you expected it to be? Where have the high points been and what have the challenges been that you didn't foresee? Okay. Um, well, getting involved in, in the industry, you have no control over when you are born and when you get involved in the industry, but your career is finite. Because as an airline pilot, there's a, a retirement age. It used to be 60. It, it went to age 65 later. And so you've got a finite number of years that you can actually do it. And your career trajectory is all based on seniority with most companies. So that means that 
it's a foot race to get in the door first because your schedules and your compensation and what you fly is directly related in a way to, uh, and the decisions that you're able to make to influence your schedule are directly related to your seniority. So I would say that, you know, people who were hired, say, in the early 70s may have had difficulties with uh, downsides of the downturns of the career uh, uh, due, because of the gas crisis or uh, other things that were happening. So the political winds are all change or maybe a war effort. Then later, if you were hired in the 80s, maybe you had another uh, issues with, with potential bankruptcies or, or, or other problems. So for my career, I was hired in the, uh, in the, in the early 90s. Uh, so uh, everything was going along seemingly fine. Uh, I would say 9-11 was the, the biggest change with the almost like the triple threat of uh, both of, of the negativity to the airline industry, both bankruptcies that, that followed uh, a terrorist event uh, and then we followed up with, uh, with downturn related to SARS uh, the first time around and, uh, and the whole world kind of changed and was put on its ear. So I would say that that was the moment that was more uh, negatively career defining because a lot of people found themselves out of work, much like the time that we're going into now where there's another downturn uh, financially. Only this one that we're incurring now is significantly different, will be prolonged uh, a much, forecast to be a much longer period of time. Um, so knowing that the industry can be fickle as, uh, as an employee, it's, I've always seen it as my responsibility to be ready for the next downturn and to try to make sure that I'm in a place that I'm not uh, living beyond my means or try to achieve multiple streams of income so that uh, when it happens, not if it happens, when it happens, you're ready. You mentioned 9-11. Can you sort of compare and contrast this reality, I know it's, it's just an entirely different scenario that's caused it, but in terms of the uncertainty, you know, the sort of looming uncertainty, I know there's been talk that the airline industry doesn't expect now to recover before 2023, 24. So as you plan your career over the next few years, how do you do that given this environment? Well, insofar as planning the career, um, your career projection, as I mentioned, is, is kind of tied to your seniority. Uh, so typically, typical career progression is always in advancing going up. But when we have downtimes and downturns like this, uh, either you experience sustained stagnation in your career progression or you move backwards. And moving backwards equates to a financial, uh, to a pay cut uh, in most cases. So I think that's just a matter of personal choices and austerity in, in your, your personal life. As far as going to work, you still are responsible, no matter what seat you occupy, for doing the right thing and keeping the airplane safe and keeping your head in the game. Because you can't let the outside factors of what's happening in the political climate and what's happening with, uh, in the boardroom of, of your particular company impact what's happening on your day-to-day -day and minute-to-minute -minute operation. That is, that's what we're ultimately responsible for. I know that in spite of the uncertainties, in spite of this crisis that you're in, in spite of the fact that you haven't flown in four months, you are entirely co committed to this career. What, what is so great about this um, that, that keeps you in the game and that keeps you looking forward to that next time you can be up there? I, first, I just love flying airplanes. I, once uh, aviation uh, gets in your blood, it's hard for it to disappear. So there are some of my colleagues who spend their off time flying around in little airplanes. I do a little bit of that. I still uh, maintain my uh, all of my certification that I used to use to teach. And I still have friends who own airplanes and I still actively go up with them because I still I, I enjoy it. And I continue to enjoy when I actually do go to work the food, music, culture, the opportunities to experience new places and new things. I see myself as a global tourist and showing up at, uh, at my favorite restaurant in Tokyo 
uh, or the street corner place to go and, and enjoy some okonomiyaki. I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing and experiencing uh, life uh, in, in that aspect of the job. And I think that's one of the greatest things. It, is, it's, it doesn't necessarily make up for being gone from home if home is where you want to be 50% uh, of the time, but it certainly is, uh, for me, one of the things that I enjoy the most about the job uh, being able to experience the the world from that uh, part. But to these days, when you get to that destination, things are significantly different because you may be quarantined uh, to your room based on whatever the regulations are. And going outside could expose you to uh, the, the long arm of the, of the law, especially if it's in another country. So your your responsibility at this point is to yourself, to your health, and to make sure that you do the right thing. Yeah, you, you mentioned being a global tourist, you know, some would argue that that flight crews, that especially pilots, captains, and, um, and you know, co-captains are, are global ambassadors, right? You, you always sort of represent um, where you're from throughout the world, represent your company. And there have been some incidents reported lately um, in parts of the world with, you know, lack of compliance and that sort of thing, the same way we're experiencing here. What, what are your thoughts about that in terms of, you know, the responsibilities that we all have to comply with whatever um, the protocols are as they develop? I think that comes down to personal responsibility. You cannot be expected to, uh, you cannot go to a, another country or into someone else's home and not follow the rules. It's that simple. We, you are correct. We are ambassadors of either a brand or ambassadors of, of ourselves. But most importantly, I, I represent me when I'm out there and I do the same things that you say, I got, I've got good home training. I would not go out into some other part of the world and do something that I'm not supposed to do. I'm concerned enough about breaking the law, even driving locally. Why would I go around the world and do something I'm not supposed to do in another country? I, it's easy to do the right thing. It's uh it's so important, and I emphasize that to the crews that I fly with as a captain. I can only be responsible for me, and I hope that everyone else, once we get uh, outside of the aircraft, is responsible for themselves. But I, I, I think it's incumbent on all of us to remind our, our crews that this is, uh, this is important, not just from a standpoint of following the law, but there are reasons that, that these uh, policies and procedures were put in place. You mentioned being concerned, you know, about about people complying, um, you know, everywhere on planes and homes. Like you said, good home training is good home training, right? You take it wherever you go. But how concerned are you in this downturn for um, the numbers of African American pilots and personnel within the airline industry? Because those numbers continue to be so low. I know when you joined about 1% of pilots were black. Now it's only 3%, which is still so minuscule, particularly compared to our level as a population, you know, of 13%. So how concerned are you about the future for black pilots in this industry? I'm very concerned. Uh, I, I would hope that the numbers that went from 1% to 3% over the time I've been involved would continue the steady uh, progression, and I would have hoped for it to be faster than it's actually occurred in the time I've been involved. But understanding that some of those barriers are the pipeline to which we look for new pilots, and some of those pilots who will be in our ranks may not live in areas where they have easy accessibility to airports or, or the knowledge that this is a career option and the only way that that's going to happen is to expose them with mentorship and opportunities. There are organizations like the uh, like OBAP, uh, Organization of Black Airline Professionals, that foster some many programs and scholarships and opportunities to put people either in aviation at large or specifically into the cockpit and give provide them with first time opportunities. So I'm I'm very concerned about it uh, enough that I. You know, I do what I can to both maintain myself as a positive role model and, and foster education uh, when I, uh, as, a, as, as something that I think it's, it's 
incumbent on all of us to continue to see that our numbers uh, reflect the reality of the demographic. Do these organizations exist as real networking arms um, and advocacy arms for those few of you who are in the profession? Absolutely. They, they uh, initially in the beginning, they, their purpose was always that, but as they've existed for now multiple decades, they, they've become stronger because our, as our membership grows, we have some folks that are very uh, committed to that purpose. And we absolutely do have uh, connections and networking throughout the, both industry and in, uh, of aviation, but, uh, but also in the military and other sides of it. And we're, uh, those, con those uh, organizations are, are well connected and you'll see at, those, at their conventions representation from all the airlines, all of the, uh, all the branches of the military, as well as uh, employers who were, were not traditionally uh, there in the past that are still seeking to, to, uh, to have diversity. You know, diversity is, isn't always uh, reflective of what it was intended to be. The, um, sometimes the diversity that, it, that occurs uh, doesn't include us. And we've been, even though we may have had a, dis a consent decree or something to that effect that said more of us should be there, it's not always the uh, us who has been the beneficiary. So I think that we have started to see a um, um, some additional uh, movement in the correct direction. So that's all I could say. It, it's been as long as it's been that I've been involved. Things are getting better. Things will, I hope, continue to get better. And it'll. But for now, that's kind of on the back burner, as a lot of airlines are downsizing and people are finding themselves furloughed. No one's thinking about hiring, but there are ample opportunities through both uh, scholarships and a, a lot of airlines are, are setting up their own uh, um, flight schools for that purpose so that they can see diversity occur. How often do you find yourself, um, you know, in, in the, on the flight deck with another black pilot with, you know, significant black crew? How, how often does this happen for you even now? It was extremely rare in the beginning of my career. Um, I think now the fact that I'm based in New York uh, and maybe that has something to do with the demographic of who wants to be there. It's more frequent and the company I work for has been more uh, progressive about, uh, about hiring. And the fact that I've, I'm now uh, more advanced in my career. So as a captain, I do get that opportunity to fly with uh, some of the folks who've been hired in the last handful of years. So I do see, uh, a lot more. As a matter of fact, I had one circumstance. This was totally uh, at random. Normally, when we show up, there's two of us. If we do long haul flights, there may be three or four of us. And on this day, there were three of us, and we were getting a, uh, uh, we were being checked by a fourth pilot, uh, just as a a matter of uh, of standardization. And this just happens randomly throughout your uh, throughout your career, probably a couple times annually. Um, all four of us were, were black pilots and it was, it was unplanned and I didn't know it until I arrived. And that was one of the things, statistical anomaly. I took a picture of that event and I, I was, you know, dumbstruck that it actually occurred, uh, that, and I was so happy to, to have been a part of it. It was, it was really cool. How did you all react? Um, it was it was, um, I, it was, it, I don't know. I, we react, we took photographs. I, we talked about it with the crew and I, I posted it on social media. I think that was, that was our reaction because ultimately still we have a job to do. And once we get away from the, whether it's high fives or, you know, shaking hands, we still uh, quietly celebrate, but uh, actively do the gig and, uh, and I think we we went out together on the layover. That's probably were, about it. Were any of those black women? Not on that uh, trip. As a matter of fact, my last flight or one of my last flights before I I had this uh, this time off uh, due to the pandemic and the lack of flying uh, was with a black woman. So one of the uh, probably 150 or so 
actively doing that uh, in the U.S. So it's almost like flying with a unicorn, the, the, the rare circumstance. But I, I am fortunate in my career to have, uh, to have experienced a lot more of that than I ever did uh, in the beginning. Yeah. How many, do you remember how many years it was before you actually ended up walking in and seeing somebody who looked like you? Seven. Wow. I think it was seven years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so you mentioned this time off. Um, and I know you've always been careful to have more than one stream of income, uh, being aware that, you know, this was a cyclical industry, that there were a lot of things you can't control. I know that pilots sort of have a, a credo about, you know, controlling what you can control, preparing for the worst, um, you know, but being, but expecting the best. So, so as you sort of entered this phase, not knowing how long it would be, um, before you flew again, how has your other life developed? How have you approached life on the ground? Um, it's it's got to have felt very very different for you. Well, let's first. I I am looking forward to the day to getting back to the to flying. That's important because to me that's how I that's my career. Uh, but the other stuff that I'm doing, I've got other business interests. I. I uh, I grew up swinging a hammer with my dad. He was a contractor and bricklayer, and he taught me uh, a lot about that. And so I've spent some of the time off going through the list of items that I have to do just around my house that being away 50% of the time that uh, has not given me the opportunity. But I'm also involved in some businesses that uh, involve residential real estate. So I'm in, in New York and LA. Uh, so I've been having the opportunity to manage uh, or actively manage some of that. I, and uh, a couple of years ago, I, I got involved in a, uh, a business that uh, produces custom furniture in the, in the Hudson Valley. And it was a business that existed for uh, 67 years. And it's been uh, a, a fun time to try to make a, a go and a turnaround, uh, a business with, that focuses on made in America and uh and makes custom furniture so we've kept the employees going and during the pandemic we were deemed uh, an essential business so that has been uh, a challenge within itself to make sure that we give customer satisfaction during this period but this is uh, uh this has just been um something that has taken as much of my time as i wanted to while i'm on the ground yeah i i know that you you grew the whole beard reality, which is not allowed when you're flying, right? It's literally still standard that you are not allowed to have full facial hair. Is that right? That's correct. We have uniform standards. So we're supposed to maintain a clean shaven. You can have a mustache, but uh, my normal look, yeah, I have never grown anything out that looked like this. So with the time off as a reminder to the calendar, how long I haven't flown, this was my, my personal testament. But I think that that will probably change going forward. Uh, because of some cultural uh, uh, issues that uh, that uh, will allow that people will say, "Hey, there's other airlines in the world that actually do allow for it. Why can we not?" It's always been uh, the the logic was that the oxygen mask would not make a good seal, and possibly some other uh, issues uh, from the FAA. So I think once those barriers uh, are removed, we will potentially see some people in the decades going forward with possibly short cropped uh, uh, beards, but that's not, the, I don't, it's not that important to me. I'm happy to shave when I go back to work. I'm just, uh, this is a temporary look for a lot of uh, airline pilots. That's not so your I'm plan to keep it, huh? Not, that's not the intent. So I know part of your life on the ground, as it were, has included actually working in the soil, which is sort of part of your heritage, but, but new to you. Talk to us about these passions that you've developed since you have time that you didn't expect to have. Sure. The, the tomatoes are growing as we speak. I mean, <laughs> I, I've, been, uh, I've been gardening. Uh, that was one of the things. I, I made a trip to a, 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 a nursery on my birthday and picked up a couple of plants. And then when I got back home, in typical fashion, I didn't just want to put them in the ground, so I ended up building raised beds and, and doing a lot more gardening than I had intended and, and setting up. Uh, I went into it full force and set up uh, the irrigation systems to go along with it, 
but I think it does kind of take me back to my roots, even beyond where I grew up in the suburbs of, of Washington, D.C., but uh, my mother's from North Carolina, grew up on a, on a, on a farm there, and the farm's still in the family. It's been in the family since the, the mid-1800s, but that is, uh, farming is in my blood, so here's my reconnection to, uh, to my roots. And yeah, I've got beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff. So I'm, look, I'm, I'm just starting to harvest some of it now. By no means do I think I, am, uh, I do this for, uh, for anything beyond the fun of it. Because I, I saw a photo that my cousin had posted and it would put anybody who's of her garden and it would put anybody to shame. It looked like a commercial rows and rows of uh of 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 vegetables it would put my little uh gardening to shame but i did get into it and learn a lot because i think uh learning is important and that's how i have spent a, a good chunk of the time actually uh learning about things that uh that i'm sure were were uh natural or came uh easier to the generations before me that knew a lot about this you may not want to become the expert gardener and farmer because I know you want to get back to work, but you know, the time is stretching out and, and the uncertainty looms. And uh, a survey was taken recently, I know, um, for the month of June, where passengers were saying, I think eight out of 10 passengers said they just didn't feel, um, you know, that they were ready to fly. They didn't feel good about it yet. And and there was some sentiment about long-term just not feeling um, the same about travel and not expecting to travel as much. Um, as you think about getting back into the cockpit, because you were flying um, when COVID was more of a reality in other parts of the globe than here. So it was already being dealt with. Um, and you were having to decide um, both within your company and just personally how to function in that environment. How do you think about what, what we're looking at going forward? How will you be different going back into the cockpit? What sorts of protocols do you expect will be different? Because things have never been the same since 9-11. And as you said, that impact on the industry was actually less than has been felt now. So uh, there's an expectation that travel will be different. I would assume there's an expectation that your job will look different. Certainly, uh, you know, post 9-11, we saw the TSA was established and we, we saw different protocols at security. We saw Richard Reed happen and, and with a shoe bomber and we saw that, you know, shoes became something that were, were tested. I think what we'll see going forward and was already occurring is temperature taking prior to showing up to work, self-monitoring, uh, to make to ensure uh, a level of safety there, continued social distancing for the passengers, wearing masks uh, both for the pass the flying public and uh, all of us in the workplace, and then doing all that we can to ensure that we have a clean environment and the airplanes are clean and and I'm sure all of the different companies are 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 doing what they can uh, to ensure that people have uh, a a safe opportunity to show up and get between you know, the, the destination between their, their home and destination. I think that uh, for me, uh, I, I just, I'm, I will go back as soon as we're ready, uh, as soon as I'm called to go back and I'm happy to be there. I don't feel any pr great risk uh, for being there doing the job, especially now that as we learn more and we learn about the, the necessity of a mask, uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I'll see that's different from four months ago, uh, when it was mandated both for passengers and crew to uh, to wear, and I think that's a good thing in the interim, at, at least until we have the the vaccine in place and it gets widely distributed. Uh, these measures will will be standard and the norm. For years, I've flown to parts of the world where, during cold and flu season, everybody on the street was uh, was masked up, or a good percentage of the population. I think now that'll just become part of our reality and it will become the new norm. And it, I don't have a problem with that. Do you expect to take any additional precautions yourself? Do, do you talk with your colleagues in the industry? You know, sort of what are people saying 
um, within your ranks about what they would like to see happen? Well, with regard to our safety, um, I think the companies have all, uh, so far, are all doing a good job. And uh, typically, we have a union that that speaks for us on on that regard. And we and and uh, those are the ways and the avenues to have those uh, those concerns expressed directly to the company. But so far, all that I've seen is positive that uh, that's coming out. And if it, if there's anyone who's uncomfortable with a particular circumstance, they usually they have the opportunity to express their discomfort in real time. And these these are issues that are of such serious uh, gravity that they get dealt with uh, immediately because say, we're in the safety business. What do you say to, to younger people who are looking for careers? You know, this is an environment where everyone's under the microscope for recruitment and retention of black people specifically. Um, you know, there's a window that's open now, we know, with Black Lives Matter um, and this movement being really effective, but we know it's not gonna stay open forever. And so, you know, as you look to younger people who maybe haven't considered aviation or who have a burning desire to pursue a career like yours and have never seen anybody like you before, what do you say to them to encourage them to do this? First, I say you can do it. I say, if you see it, you can achieve it. If you want to do this, you have avenues available to you via social media, via those organizations to reach out. And there are plenty of people that look like you that do it, but not only do they look like you that, that do this, but they are invested, invested in your success. So there's mentorship opportunities. All you need to do is connect with them and the avenues are there. So it's so much easier these days between social media and the, and the organizations with websites and all of the uh, outreach opportunities that are there that these young people, even while stuck in the house, have avenues that they can foster and continue their education and get that much closer to being, uh, to being an airline pilot if that's what you wanna do, absolutely, it's available. Because we're not always gonna be in a down cycle and we won't always be in a, in, a, in a contraction phase. Be ready, prepare yourself, and when the industry gets back to its expansion and growth, then you can walk right in the door because you'll have the, uh, you, you'll, you'll be prepared. And it's the hard work that you do now that pays off in the end. And what are you having to do to stay prepared to jump back in when, when that call comes? Um, you know, it, I'm never going to say that flying is like riding a bike and you just get back on. Uh, there's certainly what it takes. It, uh, if you've been away from it, it may take a f uh, few more brain cells to get you to do the same thing that you did normally and naturally before. But before I even go back, uh, before I'm allowed to turn a wheel, I've had a long enough time away from the flight deck that I'm required to get recertified or, um, and go back to the simulator. So for us, that is our opportunity to ensure that, uh, that we're doing everything to this, the, the same standard of safety that we always have. So I'm sure I'll, I'll make a trip to uh, the simulator. I'll spend a, a, at a minimum a couple of days there. And depending on if I am retrained on a different aircraft, which I believe is a possibility, it may be up to a month that I'll be retrained for for the new fleet that I'll be flying. So it I won't be able to go back to the line without making a trip to uh, uh, to the training center. And are you looking at potentially being in a different seat when you go back as well? You mentioned that some will be furloughed and some will be, you know, sort of go backwards a little bit. Is that something that you're that you're facing potentially? It is. And so I'm look, I currently am a captain on the 767, uh, 757 out of New York, and I will be uh, flying 787 potentially going forward. And how do so you, that, how do you feel about that? How does that, you know, when, when you expect that your trajectory is just going to continue to be sort of up or, or do you not expect that that's what it will be because of the cyclical nature of the industry? No, you absolutely do have a reasonable expectation that your career is always going to move 
uh, in a positive direction. But when it stagnates or moves back, it's by no fault of your own. And it's so you just are responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your own attitude and you're responsible to, for the discipline of doing the job that you were hired to do. Um, I can be upset. I can be, but I look forward to the day when the entire industry recovers because no matter how bad it is for me moving a little bit backwards, I have to recognize that there are colleagues of mine who I've gotten to know over these last few years flying as captain who were, who have been hired in that uh, last five to seven years who will most likely be furloughed. And I look forward not only to my career progression going forward, but the entire body coming back to work and those people being called back from, uh, from a temporary furlough. And hopefully it doesn't last too long. And, it, and those projections that you've heard about the industry coming back to normal in 2023, 24, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's true, but I can always hope for the best and plan for the worst. So in the hope for the best category, I know that, you know, you can't control these things, but let's just say yes. um, that you are creating your best first flight, getting yes. back to work. Where do you want to go? Why do you want to go there? How long do you want to be there? And what do you want to see? Because as a pilot, you're also a traveler, right? So for those of us who can't wait to get back to travel, where's your favorite place to go, your favorite place to fly, and favorite thing to do there? Well, wow. there's so many places and being gone so much. Uh, I used to say some of my favorite place to fly was, was the leg home to come back after being gone. But that was, uh, it's, it's really difficult because I like seeing new places. I like going to the places I haven't seen yet. And I'm, equally content to go to somewhere brand new as I am to go to somewhere that's, uh, that I've been hundreds of times, like say, for example, London. Um, I love being there. I love flying there. I have lots of friends there as well. So sure, I look forward to going back to what's comfortable um, and perhaps meeting up again. But if, if the first flight back um, is much like the last flight where we are, uh, all the steps that we take are around the hotel, then it almost doesn't matter uh, where we go uh, because uh, the reality that these days, until something changes, uh, we are concerned with safety to get there. And then once we're there, we're- um, Quarantine. Yeah, we're stuck in the uh, confines of our, of our hotel or compound or whatever that happens to be. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Is that what you're expecting? In the immediate return, yes, that's what I'm expecting. Um, and until there's something different, especially if I'm flying internationally and our numbers look like we look, we're just ha we're fortunate enough, hopefully, just to be able to have the political uh, ability to get to these places uh, that we uh, that the airlines are serving, because so many countries have said uh, have nixed the U.S. from from their travel list. Until we get our uh, numbers under control, I think that's the immediate uh, reality for the next couple of quarters. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's interesting because to hear you say your favorite flight was used to be the flight home. Now that you've spent so much time home, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you'll feel that way even with quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> I am looking forward to the the first flight anywhere and. Uh, I'm ready, and and the only thing I can do is uh, is make sure that everybody gets a, a good experience uh, out of it. Thank you so much for your time today. 